want to welcome you guys for joining us today. Today, we have a great presentation on the use of smart devices and the new smart home. We have with us today, we're going to have Mike Buckingham and Avi Rosenthal talk about what is happening in this space from the technology and market and uh, trends indication. And then we're going to have Jack Terrazas of DrySafer talk about an application that he's built for this space that is quite compelling. So with that, let me go ahead and bring up Avi and Mike, and let's have them come and talk a little bit about what is going on in this space. The title of their presentation today is New Smart Homes and the strategic applic applications and their use cases. This is something that's coming very fast in the marketplace, and they made quite a bit of progress in the past year. So with that, uh, Avi, can you uh, introduce yourself and tell us more about what you're doing there? And then, Mike, you'll follow as well. Well, thanks so much for having us on today. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we're excited about what uh, Jack and his team have put together. Uh, and that's why we we joined him in his efforts to uh, to bring this product to market. Um, it's a it's a very exciting time in the security and the Internet of Things space. Uh, most of you probably know that there was a major trade show last week called the Consumer Electronics Show. It's a little gathering of about 175,000 nerds and geeks. And uh, I was there. I'm one of the nerds and geeks who was there. Uh, so was Mike. And, uh, you know, it was uh, really, really gratifying to see that show really roaring back after uh, after the COVID issues that have hampered it over the last couple of years. But uh, the show was absolutely back. Um, trends coming out of the show, obviously, are all about intelligence and, and smart buildings and smart homes and our homes being more intelligent and more uh, understanding of what our needs, wants, and desires are when we enter them. And uh, because I don't know a lot necessarily about what the audience's background is, um, you know, please feel free, folks, to uh, ask whatever questions you may have, put them in the chat, uh, raise your hand, and, and we'll certainly do our best to answer them. Uh, I myself have been in the connected device IoT space uh, for a little more than 30 years. Um, there is a, a lot of uh, experience on my side. I started out as actually somebody who did the, in, the, the integrations and the installations. Uh, I started out as a security dealer down in Florida many years ago, uh, then graduated, as they call it, or moved to the dark side, where I worked for a number of major manufacturers designing and developing connected devices in the marketplace. Um, and I've invented more than 100 different products, uh, hold a patent or two, and I've actually got the ability to, uh, to, to market and produce and uh, um, manufacture those products over the years with some of the largest companies out there, your, your Legrands and your Nortex and other companies like that. Um, but really what we're here to talk about today is how these connected devices are going to lead us into the 21st century. Uh, you may have heard the expression that data is the oil of the 21st century, and that could not be any more true. Uh, the largest companies on the planet all deal somehow or another in the data that runs our daily lives. Um, that data includes where we work, where we live, how we live, what we drive, where we drive it, uh, when we enter our homes, when we exit our homes, uh, what we shop for, what we look for, what we what we buy at the grocery store, all of that data is really all about what is going to be important and, and what is going to be relevant to a lot of the um, products that are produced. Last week at CES, uh, obviously the two initials that you would expect to hear the most of, the, the AI, right, were very, very prevalent. Um, there was an AI toothbrush and there was an AI shopping cart and there was a AI, you name it, there was an AI everything. However, what most people don't realize is that AI is only as good as the data that it collects and it's only as good as the neural networks that it's connected to. One of the reasons why these little talking boxes that we all have in our homes, the, the Amazons and the Googles and the Apples, the reason why they've gotten so good at understanding what us as human beings say to them with our various accents and inflections and idioms and things like that is because they've been collecting literally billions of data points from our speech over the past five to 10 years. And they've gotten really good at it. Well, the same is true of all of the devices within our home. The reason why Google made a $600 million investment in ADT had nothing to do with the fact that Google wanted to be in the security industry. Because let's face it, Google has lots of other businesses. There's no reason for them to be in the security industry. However, what they want is what ADT has been doing for literally 100 years, 
which is collecting people's data, understanding when people enter their homes, understanding when people leave their homes, the temperature they set in their homes, when they turn their lights on, when they turn their lights off, when they exit, when they enter, when they're sleeping, when they're awake. It's like the Santa Claus of your home, right, is ADT. And so Google wants to leverage that data. And every time there is a sensor within the home that's connected to an ADT device, Google now knows about that data, now understands all of that information, and they are going to build product based on that information as well. The next part of that equation is our lovely friends in the insurance industry. State Farm also made a very strategic $150 million investment in ADT. All right, so now you're thinking to yourself, so I've got ADT, which is a 100-year-old security company. I've got Google, one of the largest companies on the planet, and then I have State Farm, one of the most popular and one of the largest insurers within the United States, all investing in the same entity. What's the common denominator? And that common denominator, very simply, is the data that is generated. The insurance companies recognize, and they've recognized since their inception, right, their statistical analysis of understanding how people live and what they do help them understand things like mortality rates and accident rates and all kinds of other things that mitigate what we pay per year in insurance rates. And so that being true, it's important for State Farm to get that data right from the source. Similar to the way that the car insurers over the years have given us these little modules that we plug into our cars and they track how we drive our cars, whether or not we hit the brakes too hard or we steer too fast or we exceed speed limits and things like that. And the car insurers have figured out that if they can get that module into the car, they can mitigate some of their risk. If they mitigate some of their risk, they lower the potential premiums and they can pass that savings on to a certain extent, because let's face it, they're not passing all that savings on. <laughs> ADT has the same opportunity. If you think about ADT, they are that little plug-in box that you put in your car, but you have in your home. One of the places where we don't have a lot of data today, other than things like emissions, is smoke and CO detection. Smoke and CO detectors are all over our homes. But what we don't do well today is we don't look for the problem before it's an issue in fire. We do that in water. There's lots of water sensors out there and lots of flow detectors out there that can mitigate when there's going to be a water problem in your home. However, there's not a lot of devices out there that look for potential fire problems in your home. There's a couple of new devices that monitor things like electricity, but the dry safer product is the very first product out there that looks for potential fire issues within a home. And that's why it's so important. It becomes another data point. It becomes another important item that gets bundled in with the other sensors that companies like ADT and Vivid and Alarm.com and other companies out there are installing in people's homes to collect that data, understand what is going on within the home, and can make intelligent decisions using that all-powerful AI that we all like to talk about and be able to mitigate risk within people's homes. So where we are in the state of the market today is we are on a steep growth path. Things are going very well in the smart home security sector. Um, there's a, somewhere between a 12 and 15% growth rate year over year. Things are very robust. Last week at the Consumer Electronics Show, even better numbers came out. Um, they're now pegging the smart mm -hmm. home industry at about $29 billion with a CAGR of around 12 to 15%. That is, is huge growth. That's a huge market. Having been in this market now for the past 30 years, I can tell you that we have seen explosive growth over the last 10 of that 30 years. We finally reached the point where everybody understands what smart devices mean and how smart devices can help do things like mitigate risk, uh, lower daily life, uh, excuse me, lower premiums for daily life, and then provide convenience and safety within our homes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. He's going to give you a little bit more of a slant on some of the things that he worked on last week and over the last few months with Jack. And we are now interested in, uh, in and if there are certainly any questions, please, we're, we're here to help. Well, thank you, Avi. Thank you for the very uh, succinct uh, report there on the industry. Um, I haven't been in the industry quite as long as Avi, but I've uh, I've known him and been in the industry for over 20 years now. Um, and you remind me that I gave a presentation on smart home 
connected devices, life safety, like smoke detectors to State Farm about 15 years ago. And they weren't quite ready for that, but apparently they are now uh, with their investment in the ADT and Googles of of, of the world. Nice. So um, really my, uh, my stance here is having been in this industry for long enough, um, you see the uh, maturity of non-connected devices becoming connected. Um, we all have connected devices in our home. We have apps. This is very prevalent in our day-to-day -day life. Um, even if we don't know we have connected devices, um, we certainly do in our homes. Um, the infrastructure is there, um, and, and the idea that you can have um, a life safety device um, like the Dry Safer product, which, by the way, has sold very well, and Jack will tell you about it, um, sold very well as a standalone product with a local alarm. Um, when the, when the dry safer when the, when the dryer lint, um, you know, gets backed up, this sounds a local alarm that sold very well in the Home Depots, Lowe's, um, you know, consumer channels. But the idea that this product can now be connected and brought into the infrastructure with not only the ADTs of the world, but as Avi mentioned quickly, you know, the Vivens, um, other security uh, and life safety providers that um, is the opportunity for dry safer um, to be able to mitigate the risk, to be able to inform and action upon what could be a life safety event before it happens. And we see this happening throughout the industry. Traditional security is going uh, by the wayside um, and being replaced by proactive um, surveillance, video surveillance. We want to see that the crime is happening before it happens. Uh, there's no sense in sending the authorities 15 to 20 minutes after the burglar has breached your house, right? In the same vein, that local alarm for dry safer may have gone off in the past. There may have been no one home to hear it. Now your phone and more importantly, your monitoring company can be informed that there is a, a, a potential fire or fire risk or actual fire in your home. And Jack's going to fill you with all the data very compelling in terms of the number of fires that occur uh, because of the lint blockage in your dryer vent, which is something that is completely out of sight and out of mind for me until I met Jack several years ago. Um, so Avi and I have come to partner with him to develop this connected product. We hope you participate in that. Um, we are experts. We're, we're involved in this industry on a daily basis, uh, have brought a number of different products to market. And uh, we're here to tell you that this market is extremely real and this patented product from Dry Saver, there's nothing like it on the market today. Um, and it satisfies an immediate need uh, in that industry. That is really what I've had prepared. Um, wondering if there's uh, any questions that have come up here on the docket yet or not, or- We, we had one comment that came through from uh, Ken. Uh, basically he says State Farm, Put a, made a $1.2 billion investment in ADT for 15% of it. Google invested $450 million in ADT and then $150 again in September 2022. State Farm then made a $300 million investment in a development fund prior to purchasing their shares. So, so basically, Google invested $450, then $150 and prior to purchasing stage. What, what's your comment on all those investments from State Farm and Google? Where, what are we seeing from that? So, and and I apologize if, if my comments were misunderstood. Uh, Ken is absolutely right. Google made a total $600 million investment. Uh, and at the time, they actually gobbled up a, a good chunk of them. ADT stock then went higher. And so when State Farm came in, in order for them to buy a bigger chunk of them, they actually had to invest more money. But they had made a strategic uh, investment in a development fund to develop more sensors and things. That's where the 150 number came in. And then, of course, they made an additional. Then they decided to buy a big chunk of um, a big chunk of ADT as well. It is our opinion, and this is opinion. This is not ADT has not announced anything, but it's our opinion essentially that Google will acquire the rest of ADT in the next three to five years. Um, ADT has already announced that their software platform, and this is public, um, their software platform will migrate to a Google invented software platform end of next year. Uh, the alarm.com folks who they use their platform today 
have already announced that ADT has told them that they will be off the alarm.com platform by the end of 25. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, we're, it's going to be ADT Google in the very near future. The reason why I bring this up, because there's other, there are other examples of companies investing in these data neural network companies, as I call them. Um, there are other real world examples like energy buying Vivint and others. Uh, but the reason why I bring this up is to drive home the idea that additional sensors and additional data collection points are very important to the market overall. Everything that we saw last week at CES pointed to the fact that it is all about data collection. Whether it's a smart toothbrush that monitors how well you brush your teeth or a smart watch that monitors your health or a, a smart bed that monitors how you sleep or smart door window sensors that monitor when they open and close. The idea is that we are, we are living more and more in a world that is connected. And the reason that it's connected is so that that data can be collected so that intelligent choices can be made based on the data that is collected. The whole concept of AI, everybody's talking about AI. And the reason why AI is so important is because it's garbage in, garbage out. The better data that the AI can collect, the better information and the better the AI decision-making tree looks. And so again, that's where Dry Safer comes in. It's another opportunity for us to collect that very important data, be able to leverage that data and be able to make intelligent decisions based on the data that we've collected. So my, my question is about cybersecurity. Uh, that's one of the biggest issues with IoT is what protections are in place. From the CE, CES show, did you find anything that was revolutionary, game-changing for cybersecurity protection? So yes, as a matter of fact, there are a number of companies that are tackling that. There's, there's two issues. There's cybersecurity and data privacy. Those are really the, the big issues that everybody is dealing with. You may have heard about some new standards and some new methods of communication. One of them is called Matter. Um, one of the things that all of these new RF standards or these new methods of communication are doing is they're protecting the data. They're locking the data in a box. They're encrypting it and encoding it. And so the good news is because we are merely at DrySafer, we are merely a data point, our data is stored by others and we've mitigated the risk to cybersecurity and data privacy at dry safer. So that's really good news. The, the, the reliance and the re responsibility of the cybersecurity and of the data privacy is the role and responsibility of the folks we're connecting to. And we've mitigated that risk as a company here at dry safer. However, that being said, we make sure that our product is completely compliant with the methodology of, of communication that are established by the industry to follow their rules, follow their regulations. The government now has mandates about data security and data privacy, and we absolutely adhere to those rules in the way that we communicate our data to these central servers. Great. My next question is around the data play itself. Some industries are very well developed in their data markets and data uh, standards uh, such as healthcare is one of the best out there. How does uh, this market compare to healthcare? How far along is it and how mature is it? Another excellent question. And I think the answer to that question is everything to do with the fact that Google and State Farm invested in ADT. Um, it has matured to the point where that data is now being collected. It has matured to the point where the data is understood. What we haven't really done yet, and this is the interesting part, is we haven't monetized that data. We're doing a great job collecting it. We're doing a great job evaluating it. We're doing a great job protecting it. What we're not doing a great job yet at is making money on it. And that's where <laughs> Google and Energy and some of these other companies come in because they haven't quite figured out what the monetization model looks like to monetize that data. So the beauty of what we've done at DrySafer is we've created a unique product to be able to add to that stream and be part of that stream. Uh, and so we are going to be relevant to these companies like State Farm, like Allstate, like Google, like ADT, because they're gonna want the data points that we're collecting. And because we're a unique product, we're in a unique position to be able to leverage our place in the home. 
No, that's great. That's great. Uh, my last question before you open back up for the audience is, I recently did a project in the automotive industry, and I was surprised at how sophisticated the electronic stack was inside the automobile. And of course, you need that in order to support sophisticated applications. How would you describe the tech stack inside the consumer electronic deployments today? Is it fully developed or is it still emerging? So the good news is nobody has to drive their house down the tr street autonomously. <laughs> so that's the good news, right? So we, we I would say that on the on the elect the electric vehicle side of things, as you know, it's still a developing network, right? This idea that I can drive from coast to coast and be able to charge my car the whole way, that's still developing. We're a little bit more mature on the home side, but we're a little less sophisticated on the home side. Um, because the change that happens within the home is slow and deliberate, uh, people don't want to change necessarily the way that they live their lives. And so we've had to uh, adjust to the slow cadence that people make those radical changes. Whereas in a car, every year you buy a new one or every year they bring in a new model. And so they're able to make grand changes once a year in the automotive space, in the, in the, re, in the residential space, in the multifamily space, in the hotel space, changes happen a little bit more deliberately and a little bit more uh, slowly, but it has matured. I've been lucky enough to be here for since the early nineties. And so, you know, I've, I've gotten to see what's going on in the marketplace. And I can tell you that, you know, it is radically different than what we had 30 years ago. In some ways, there are some things that are still very much the way that they were. A front door lock is still a front door lock. There are a lot of people out there still carrying keys. But in my world, nobody carries a key. The same way in your car, you don't carry a key. Or you put the key in your pocket and you never take it out of your pocket. Right? So a lot of parallels but I would say that the maturing of the systems in the home have come a very long way. There's still a lot of work to do, and that work represents opportunity. Right. Well, one more question. What is the killer app in the consumer space for uh, IoT connected devices? I got the app for my Whirlpool oven, but I can hardly call that a killer app. I can turn it on here at my desk, or I can walk 20 feet over and hit the button. Not, not quite the killer app I thought it was, but what would you call the killer app if we have one so far? Uh, you know, Mike, uh, I'd love to hear your input on this as well. For me, the killer app are these little talking boxes. I can tell you that I've lived in a automated smart home since the mid nineties, right? Because I'm the geek and the nerd and I had all the cool stuff. And, but when my family really started to take advantage of the devices that we had in our <laughs> home was when we got the talking boxes. So we, we do Amazon in my house, but Google and, and Apple are all very relevant. So for me, the killer app was to be able to talk to something and have it do what I ask it to do. Mike, you, you have a... Well, yeah, I mean, a similar vein. I mean, the talking boxes, of course, are uh, are the prevalence and the integration with almost everything under the sun that's connected. Uh, for me, it's, it's the phone in your pocket as well, right? I mean, whether it's Siri on your phone, um, everyone who has an Apple phone, whether they know it or not, has HomeKit which is an interface that integrates with thousands of products. Um, and then from the Google side, um, Android operating system, you have Samsung. Uh, many years ago, they invested in a very small company called SmartThings, and they have turned that into a very large platform. SmartThings um, you know, obviously communicates with all Samsung products, but almost every other connected devices uh, on the market. Uh, SmartThings is a free app. You can download it right now, and you would be blown away by how many things you can connect to in your home through a central interface. And, and that's really the opportunity we're talking about. Now, that's consumer-centric. Um, the exciting thing about this product um, is the ability to connect with uh, the enterprise applications that we're talking about, the back-end systems of these major security systems, these major um, life safety corporations. So at DrySafer, we have the opportunity not only to provide the homeowner with an interface of where they can find out um, about a life safety event from their house, um, but also um, from the uh, enterprise applications as well. I'm surprised Apple's not in this game already. We mentioned Google and typically Microsoft and the others are not far behind like Amazon. I think Amazon bought the iRobot to get the data that way. What, what do you see Apple doing? So as Mike just mentioned, Apple HomeKit is definitely a, a burgeoning uh, system. Uh, Apple takes a very deliberate path to market. You know, they, they want to... They usually do a fast follow in these kinds of things. They do a lead in others, but in this particular case, they're doing a fast follow. So they're watching 
the smart home sector, the smart apartment sector. Um, it's very complex, very complex. And there are lots of potential pitfalls. And I think the Apple folks, justifiably so, are taking a measured approach. Uh, but Apple HomeKit, like Mike said, is on every iPhone. There it is, right there, the buck house. If you know it or not, or have it set up, if you swipe down from the top right of your phone, you will access the HomeKit feature. They have not pushed it the way that we thought Apple may have by this point in time. They're starting to push it more and more, but it's been there for many years, um, right. kind of under the hood. Um, Apple could could make a very big change in the adoption rate of this market by simply pushing that feature a little bit further. Great. Exactly. Well, if there are any questions in the audience, please post them. If not, we'll go ahead and move to our next presenter, Jack Tarazas of Dry Safer. Jack has an application in this space he wants to share with us. Jack, mm -hmm. if you like, go ahead and launch your slides. And of course, we'll make this interactive, ask questions along the way. Okay. Now you can see, uh, Paul, as a quick comment, how valuable Avi and Mike are going to be to the uh, Dry Safer business launch. Absolutely. We certainly hope so. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you will. Okay, uh, let me just get this. All right, well, basically, we feel like it's going to be the next breakthrough in the home security apps, which I believe that Avi and uh, Mike pretty much talked to that. Uh, what our goal is to disrupt a, let's see if I can get this thing going here and no, you have to tell me when to when you want the next slide, Jack. Oh, oh, okay. Next slide. So there's 90 million clothes dryers in the United States, and uh, the National Fire Protection Agency or Association says there's 15 deaths, 400 injuries, and 200 million in property damage. The 200 million in property damage is probably understated by 250 percent because the, the, the guys that actually do the uh, vent cleanouts. They say that most of the people just don't want to claim a, uh, a dryer fire because it's going to add to their insurance. Uh, next slide. So the problem, highly flammable in buildup inside clothes dryers and exhaust vents. They kill, maim, and destroy lives. As you can see, it, uh, it's hidden. Lint is kind of a hidden danger because it appears inside dryer ducts, uh, also on rooftop vents. There's also, in addition to lint buildup, there's also bird nests. Yeah, anything that restricts airflow, uh, we don't really see it, but it does cause the dryer to work harder and hotter. It eventually burns out the, it overheats and it burns out the uh, the dryer motor and uh, causes uh, dryers, to the motors to start on fire. And in a lot of cases, you've seen the uh, homes start on fire. Okay. So the next slide. We've developed an early detection lint alert app. And what it does is it alerts homeowners and property managers of the danger of lint buildup before it causes the uh, dryers to overwork. And you can see here this uh, this lower image here where you see the, and this is this is common where people put these long vents, uh, these, these uh, I'm sorry, the uh, vent hoses in the attics and that every time you see a curve or a bend, it builds up lint, and that uh, dryer motors are not made to be blowing out exhaust air from the uh, dryer this far along. And fortunately, our utility patent, we've done a tons of testing, and it actually detects lint buildup 90 feet away, which is important because there's a lot of dryers that are in basements of uh, two-story homes. So by the time you add eight foot in the basement, uh, another eight to nine feet on the first floor, the same in the second, and then 15 to the roof, you know, that could be 70, 80 feet away. Our lint alert detects the, the uh, air restriction all the way up to that rooftop. Okay, on the next slide, uh, it's pretty easy to, we, we developed it for easy installation. Uh, at, the, at number one, the airflow sensor, which is the elbow-shaped device that you install. Basically, all you do is you twist it onto the back of the uh, dryer, and the dryer vent is uh, four inches, which is universal to all dryers, whether it's Samsung, LG, uh, Whirlpool, or GE. It's, it universally fits all gas and electric dryers. 
And uh, so what happens is there's a flap inside there uh, that, that that opens up totally when it starts closing a little bit up to 45 degrees, it sends an alert to the homeowner or property manager that it's time to, that they need to clean out their vents. Uh, and that's what the app will do. It'll send an alert to, uh, to the app and then hopefully, uh, you know, people will start cleaning out their vents before the uh, start burning up more energy. On the next slide, here's a good slide that, uh, on this next slide, uh, you basically install the, the uh, as I mentioned, the elbow on the back of the dryer. Then you put the, connect the uh, vent hose on the other side of the uh, device. Uh, connect, there's a, there's a uh, communication cord from the elbow to the app device. You plug it into a 110 volt outlet, download the app and you register it, real simple. Okay, next slide. One thing that we found is that uh, by doing this, and the inventor, Tom Asciola, has been in the business for 35 years. He owns a successful, a successful uh, appliance repair business. 90% of his dryer calls are because the dryer is taking too long to dry. And when it does, through testing, we found that it exponentially accelerates. So once it goes beyond the 30 or 35 minutes, by making the dryer work harder, it's using up a lot more energy. And uh, as you know, carbon footprint's a highly topical uh, issue today. And by saving up the uh, energy, in fact, when we first met with the uh, Home Depot buyer, it was a female and she said, you ought to make the packaging all green. She said, I think energy savings is more important than preventing dryer fires. Anyhow, that's a side note. On the next slide, as far as competition, uh, we really don't consider competition uh, I put a, a chart here like do-it-yourself installation. Ours is designed for DIY installation. Lintler does not. It requires a professional contractor to install. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a polycarb elbow that eliminates cross bench. I mean, anything that you look at, uh, if you look at the next slide, it kind of tells the whole story on Lintler. As you see in this figure three, all the different tappings and, and uh devices you have to put, you have to drill a hole in the vent. Nobody really wants to be drilling holes in the vent. And if they do, if they don't do, uh, drill it perfectly, it's just not going to work. That's why the Home Depot and Lowe's of the world, uh, they never in, uh, uh, stock this product because of the huge liability of returns. Next slide here, <clears throat> excuse me, on the next slide, uh, as Avi and Mike pointed out, we're going to sell through a number of verticals, the home security systems such as ADT. There's thousands of appliance repair companies, home warranty insurance companies, uh, in-home service providers, whether they're electricians, plumbers, uh, HVAC. They, in fact, we got orders uh, just two weeks ago from an uh, HVAC uh, company up in Minneapolis that ordered 16 units. So we've got a lot of opportunity across a number of channels, and we've got great relationships in all of them. And on the next slide, uh, our business model, we're gonna start again, as Avi mentioned with the MDUs, uh, there's a multiple channels. We're gonna be doing B2B hardware sales through the home security installers. And then we'll eventually get into the retail with the Wi-Fi model. And then we're gonna monetize it. And how we monetize it is on the next slide here, We can monetize it through uh, application data. First, number one with the uh, MDUs, we'll be able to either sell direct or sell on a monthly base, base fee, which they will pass along to their uh, re uh, their tenants. You know, if you charge five or 10 bucks a month for a couple of years, it's going to be twice as much as what we would sell it for. And then these MDUs are going to use it uh, as an additional security a marketing device, get more uh, rent, more uh, monthly payments. Uh, we're going to sell this application data to manufacturers. If you can imagine Whirlpool or Samsung and these large companies being able to know what the demographics are of their uh, customers, they can customize your marketing initiatives and it just be uh, a huge value to them. And the next slide here, 
there's 90 million, going back to the 90 million dryers, you know, everybody says, well, let's go for a 5% market penetration. Well, that's 400, and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, four and a half million dryers. We're looking at a total of uh, 500,000 units in four and a half years, which is only a half a percent, which we feel, you know, if we're going to take the uh, under promise and over deliver on our, our uh, and Avi and Mike might be looking at these numbers saying they're really under stated, but, you know, we want to, we want to keep the, uh, we even feel though with this growth, uh, revenue and to be up to 32, 33 million in two, 2028. And by keeping our overhead low, outsourcing uh, key management positions, we can also obviously keep the uh, net profit high. This, by the way, on these units does not include the uh, uh, water leak sensors, which if we just did one per installation, and again, we're told that when somebody installs dry safer, you can install what you can also sell upsell the uh, water sensors to the uh, adjacent washing machine, also uh, dishwashers, water heaters, and any anything else that could potentially leak in the home. So there's a lot of upside in that as well. On the next slide, as far as uh, the team goes, my background is mostly in the do-it-yourself business. I've been in. Uh, DIY home improvement since, well, since Home Depot only had uh, two or three stores. I've uh, introduced over 300 million in new products. Uh, Tom Asciola, the inventor, uh, he's learned a business from the ground up just repairing and uh, servicing thousands of dryers. So he's great at, uh, uh, you know, just hands-on product. Randy is our manufacturer right now in Texas. Got a lot of great experience in manufacturing. Uh, he's also got experience in uh, retail as an original buyer with uh, Builder Square and Lowe's. And then, of course, on the next slide, you've got uh, Avi and Mike, and they already gave their background on it. So we've got, just with the five of us, we cover pretty much every facet of uh, the business model, engineering, manufacturing, fulfillment, et cetera. I won't go through all the details of this, but uh, we started off with the concept. We've gone through three generations, uh, obviously learned, it improved on each one, got feedback, and uh, now it's time to get into the uh, uh, smart home appliance business. Then on the next slide, we're looking at a $600,000 cash raise at a buck 25 a share, uh, tranches of 15,000 uh, minimum for 12,000 shares. Got about 3.7 million outstanding shares and warrants. And after dilution, we'd have about four and a half million. We'd, by the way, put in personally 220,000 bucks out of our own savings, knowing that we've got a winner here and uh, are really confident with the team. And on the next slide, uh, the 600,000, about 16.7% will go through R&D, tooling, field testing, et cetera. The other 50% uh, of it will be for initial inventory and then 33% into uh, business and operating expenses, marketing, uh, some key trade shows that we're going to need to go to. And then uh, hopefully get to the self-capitalization phase as we get orders. We also it can be factoring and work with a number of factoring companies that uh, rather than further diluting uh, our shareholders, we can just, it's a lot more more efficient to uh, uh, factor the orders. And then finally, on the last uh, second to the last slide, I believe uh, exit strategy. Mike and uh, Avi hit on some of these. I mean, any one of these companies can can buy us an ADT. I think when some of these companies uh, start getting involved with dr dry safety, they're going to say, "Well, we can accelerate the growth by just taking the product on and and selling it to our existing customers." Uh, I think ADT probably has, I believe, what, 25 or 30 million customers, uh, even an Amazon or a Honeywell. And between the great relationships that Avi and Mike have, they could walk into the office of Honeywell uh, and a lot of these other ones with our with uh, selling the uh, dry saver. So that pretty about, much is it. You think about Honeywell acquiring First Alert, um, 
either earlier this year or late last year, yeah. example of convergence of the in industry. So, so one of the questions I have is, do insurance companies offer discounts if they have your solution or are you did a discussion with them? Well, they initially did years ago when the smoke alarms came up because obviously they felt that if, if uh, people started installing half a dozen smoke alarms, uh, they're going to have less liability at home starting on fire. And we've talked to him, you know, it's kind of of a challenge hall when you don't have the uh, the app with you. Although we have met with some, uh, a number of insurance agents from State Farm. Uh, USAA is headquartered in San Antonio here with about 17 million uh, armed services members that they focus on. Every one of them says, you know what, once you get the app, it'll be a no brainer, but we need to, to have that. And then they'll get with their people and, uh, if nothing else, they said, if they didn't do a discount, possibly just through PR, uh, help recommend it or promote it, you know, just like they do with smoke alarms. Great. And yeah. there's also a data play here. Uh, be interesting to see at what point will we be in a place where we can actually sell the data and how much you think you might get for it per, you know, a hundred users or whatever. That would be something I think Avi or Mike would be able to, yeah, so Hall, right. I don't think it's a direct sale of the data. It's more a, like Jack mentioned during the MDU portion of his presentation, it's more about the mitigation <laughs> of risk sale of the data. And so it's not like you're going to say, okay, for every time you use your dryer, it's another half a penny, right, worth of data. It's more about uh, recurring revenue to lower insurance rates because there is a program with the major insurers, if you can show mitigation they will give a discount for your product it's just a question of going through their testing and and uh, checking the boxes once you do that you can lower insurance rates there are programs especially in the mdu market where you can participate in that lowered um premium plan and so you get a piece of what you're saving them and that's really the way that the data would get sold in those in those methodologies today it's very hard to sell individualized data. Right. I was thinking more aggregated data and causal <clears throat> data, people that uh, have this income, yes. you know, use it, use the dryer this many times, these people that have this income, use it less or more. And then you start to figure out where should we be buying and selling dryers for, because we, we know the usage rate based on different demographic information. We never care in about people's individual private information, we're just looking at more causal information that might inform a marketer in what to look for or an ideal customer they might pursue. Absolutely. Those are all valid valid data collection points by all means. Okay. So it sounds like you guys are going down that path as well. Can you tell us more about the uh, uh, the product itself as far as uh, you know what uh, the current sales channel is that you're going for and what the current situation is there? Well, right now what we decided to do uh, as I mentioned, about three years ago, we started interviewing. Uh, we went through probably eight to 10 app developer com uh, software companies from San Antonio, Houston, Dallas. And we finally, after about three or four months, selected one who also uh, became a partner. Uh, we did some uh, pay, you know, we paid them. And in addition to that, we also offered them shares in lieu of some uh, development time. So they have some skin in the game as well. Uh, and then it took, we started developing it with them and then COVID hit and uh, their software team was out of Pakistan, which was one of the uh, areas that get hit uh, really bad with COVID. And we lost about eight to 12 months with them. And then by the time they got back, uh, we started developing the Wi-Fi unit and actually completed the Wi-Fi. We've got a, uh, a demo on the Wi-Fi unit and that's actually completed now the software. And then we started uh, doing the, the, we decided, okay, we've got to start raising some funds. But in the meantime, we put all our focus on the Wi-Fi and uh, Z-Wave and meeting and getting the team together with Avi and, and uh, Mike and some others. So we haven't really focused. We've got about 2,000 units in inventory that we're selling through Amazon and uh, to some contractors that happen upon our, our website, but our main focus now, our energy is, is in uh, number one, getting the funding and then working on the R&D to get the, uh, the Z-Wave. Right. 
Well, this is not your first rodeo with this product. You have quite a bit of experience with it. Can you tell us more about your first versions of it that came out and the history you've had with it? Well, what we started to do is uh, on the first generation, we went to a number of these. There's actually uh, uh, trade shows for vent cleaners and uh, there's NADCA, National Association of Duck uh, Cleaners. And we were a big hit and we actually signed up the largest uh, distributors of appliance parts. Uh, there was a separate chimney sweep show they have twice a year that Tom went to and signed up the four largest uh, chimney sweep distributors with this uh, second generation. Uh, the problem with distributors are you're you're kind of uh, dependent on the the sales reps that they have to go in there, and unfortunately, a lot of sales reps are order takers and not really pioneers of new product. Uh, then we also sold uh, with our second generation chain wide Menards, which is the third largest home improvement center behind Lowe's and Home Depot. They're headquartered out of uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And uh, one of the uh, a big challenge with retail chains is that you have to get uh, execution of the product placed. And if they put uh, dry saver in the plumbing department as opposed to the appliance department, it's not going to get the same traffic and it's not going to have the natural tie in with washing machines and dryers. Uh, we also sold uh, Lowe's 400 stores and had to go through five buyers before we got the PO because the first buyer, uh, again, another challenge is these buyers are changing from uh, the first buyer was with the, with uh, appliances. And then he got moved over to plumbing and we got a guy from lawn and garden. And next thing you know, it's like, Hey Jack, I need, six months to catch up on this large appliance business. And by the time he does, they change him and he gets somebody from lighting. So after all these headaches, we decided, you know what, let's just get with the smart home uh, uh, security business and pass up on the retailers until we get that going. Then it'll be a lot easier to go into a uh, Home Depot and Lowe's uh, and be able to merchandise it just like they do with smoke alarms uh, and other security products. So I think we're going in the right path now with the B2B. Uh, and then also, of course, Amazon will be huge once we get more uh, brand recognition. So we've gone through the three generations, uh, sold every one of them, and it's kind of led to where we're at now. So the other thing is once we have interconnectivity with other software platform, we can join the true smart home. Uh, the retailers will be much more um, uh, happy to put us on their shelves. Both Lowe's and Home Depot are relaunching their smart home initiatives this year. And so there's ample opportunity to connect to those systems. Uh, and then once we're connected to them, to ride their coattails. Good point. That's right. So this is a version one of the software. What do you think version two and three might entail? What features do you have on the roadmap for the future? Well, with Avi and, and Mike in the in that channel or those channels for a number of years, I think they'd be better to answer that uh, than I would. Yeah, I, I, I can I can take that. I mean, version one is to create um, a connected product uh, that doesn't necessarily utilize a consumer app. Um, and the reason for that is there's a technology in the industry called Z-Wave, uh, which allows you to connect your product to many other head-in systems. And when we think about life, safety, and security, uh, there's 35 million homes in the United States that have Z-Wave products in their home. Um, and those are uh, installed by, you know, the security companies that we spent a lot of time naming today, the Vivens and ADTs, uh, Brinks of the world. Um, the, the idea of that is that uh, we can very quickly, without um, a whole lot of cost and app development, UI development, we can bring this product into other uh, ecosystems. It becomes a product that's part of an existing ecosystem. Um, this product can be retrofit or be part of a new installation. Um, so from that, we can go in with our industry, um, with our with our industry connections, and very easily get this product incorporated into those ecosystems. The opportunity there is significant. Um, Beyond that, in a future iteration, we will certainly bring out a Wi-Fi version um, of the uh, dry saver, which is, you know, basically the consumer version uh, that's sold today. Um, any connected product that you find in, you know, in Best Buy, for instance, um, is a Wi-Fi product that has its own app. Um, that would be the iteration that would be sold direct to the consumer. 
Um, that would be the one that Amazon would take to it, work with your Alexa, um, et cetera, et cetera. But we see um, as a first uh, run, you know, really as the most cost effective way to get into the market and also the biggest um, opportunity being with that Z-Wave um, connected layer RF technology to be able to integrate with the most popular head in systems um, in in that in that channel. Did I miss anything there, Avi? No, no, that's a that's a good explanation of it. And then there's some also uh, there are some other RF languages that are coming out that are going to be standards in the future. And we're positioning the products so that we can literally plug and play these other communication standards into it to take advantage of those market opportunities. You know, one thing, and, one and thing this all... group may have heard about matter. Matter is a technology that's um, is uh, promises to be the connective glue for everything that is connected in this world. Uh, it gets a lot of uh, fanfare. It's backed by the major, you know, Amazons and Apples and Facebooks of the world. Um, it's not quite ready for prime time, but when it is, that's certainly something that this product can be um, addressed to uh, communicate with as well without a whole lot of extra development. Um, so as obvious stated, he's built uh, over 100 products. He is chairman of the Z-Wave Alliance. He's chairman of, uh, he's on the board of other connected technology uh, consortiums. So uh, we're very excited. Um, we have Jack with a product that's been uh, productive, has sold extremely well through major retailers. There's a market out there and it really is taking this product with a minimal investment, making it connected and bringing it to a much um, larger um, available market. Great. Thank you for that. Yep. Uh, Jack, what were you going to say? Well, one other uh, channel that we haven't spoken about was, uh, and we've looked at before, is the uh, a lot of the hotels and also commercial laundromats have a six-inch diameter uh, and their dryers. And that's a whole other channel we can go after once we've gotten this going. We can, uh, we can fund some tooling for that. Uh, a lot of these laundromats have uh, run into a lot of trouble because they're owned by individuals that, or, or they may own a half a dozen laundromats, and they just don't clean out their their dryer vents as often as they should. And being able to have an app that says, "Hey, you need to clean out the, your laundromat that's 50 miles away," then they can call somebody to get it cleaned out before it starts on fire. Or you, if it's running too long, it's going to be using up a lot more energy. And the same thing with all the hotels. That have commercial lawn uh, washing machines that have uh, our dryers that have six inch diameters. So that's another channel that we can go after. But as uh, the two guys said, the, the the largest opportunity right now, the lower hanging fruit, is the uh, Z Wave, the MDUs. Great. Right. Okay. Well, we're at the end of our time, guys, and want to thank you for taking time, Avi, Mike, for your presentation on the trends in CES and in the consumer space that we're at. And Jack, I want to thank you for your presentation on Dry Safer and the opportunity that it is. We'll get this out to all the investors following your deal, see who may be more of interest, and appreciate uh, all the questions and the good feedback. With that, we'll go and wrap it up for today and hope to see you again soon. All right. Thank thanks, everybody, for participating. Thank thanks. Get it.